probably the three youngest people at the convention. <laughs> so we, we've got uh, Pete, Jonas and Chris who are going to talk about the AMSAT SAO payload. I'll pass it over to Chris who's going to start off. Thanks very much. Uh, maybe one of those guys grabs that one. There you go, lovely. Um, Thank you very much, Mike. Um, so we're here for the uh, 48th instalment of the ISAO program. Um, <laughs> no, I just. Um, but it's been a long sort of time coming, and, and things are coming to fruition. And we wanted to give you an update, uh, really, on what's happening uh, with our payload and what's happening with the mission um, in general, and to showcase off what uh, really our, our lovely students can get up to and what they're kind of getting out of the program. Um, we often hear very much. Uh, about really where uh, we take our programs, what we do in the amateur communities. Um, but the other part of that is, of course, education and bringing our young people um, through education and to do that in collaboration with and complementary to amateur radio. Um, so uh, as I kind of alluded to, as AO has been going for some time now, um, and there's quite a rich heritage um, in, in and actually who's been involved yeah, you, your signature is probably out there, Graham. Um, heritage, right? That's the right word, I think. Um, and it goes back to around the 2000s, and there's been various different people involved um, in ZAO, but it's essentially matured into uh, a, a microsatellite that's around 45, 50 kilos, um, that is allowing uh, university students and university um, sort of programs to get involved in the building and the development uh, of, of a mission. Uh, so the main uh, contractor was uh, Alma Space um, and is now Citel, um, which are based out in Italy. Um, and they've essentially been putting together uh, this microsat. Um, so this is where we are. We're one of these boxes um, that sits in this sort of bottom tray here. Um, and we've been delivering for this um, essentially a system, uh, a box that's got three parts really into it. Um, a VHF transmitter, an L-band receiver. Um, and then a, what we call a microprocessor, or CCT board, beg your pardon, uh, and EPS board. And so each of these different components has been built by uh, different sort of uh, parts of our group. Um, the VHF and L-band um, uh, boards themselves have been uh, done by David Bowman, uh, G0 uh, MRF. Um, and our students here and myself have been working on the processing system. So you'd have heard from uh, Valter and other uh, talkers earlier um, in the conference about really what's been going on in the FunQ program. Um, and certainly for the focus on this, it was to sort of ha have further capabilities, um, things that could be software driven, um, and moving towards a lot of the SDR efforts that I've been working in. Um, so it has lots of different people from um, lots of different places, um, and we've been able to work with certainly some of them um, to share facilities, um, to share knowledge about what's going on with the program, um, but also just to get more exposure um, into some other places as well. So for us, our payload objectives really, for certainly to AMSAT in the UK, was to provide a 1260 uh, and 145 megahertz transponder. Uh, with the downlink being on 145895, uh, and that will transmit down the typical uh, Funcube one, uh, Funcube, sorry, telemetry format. So it does the full uh, encoding scheme that you would see to operate with a regular dashboard. Um, but we also have a further mode um, that was asked um, by us to go in, which is a backup science mode, um, to see whether or not we can transmit something a bit wider. So we actually have the system can go at 4K8 as well, which sounds like, um, I'm quoting perhaps some of my colleagues here, an angry Funcube. Um, so instead of you getting the nice tone uh, every sort of five seconds, it's, mm, it's angrier, right? Oh, well, one of the things obviously we've been doing in, in the FunQ program is to see what we can do to provide um, educational services and outreach really for schools and educational purposes um, and to then have a dashboard to display things in attractive formats and of course all of these things will hopefully culminate in our grand unified design. Um, perhaps look into the camera for you, Duncan. Um, so they essentially encourage students to use that data. We've collected, obviously, many, many gigabytes um, down from lots of these different missions now. Um, and Isaiah was one more that adds to that sort of fleet. Um, again, to <coughs> encourage STEM subjects in, in our way. Um, but for us, you know, the, um, you, there's an FM transponder for the radio amateurs and that bat satellite backup um, at 4K8 as well. So who are the team? Um, the typical bunch of miscreants. Um, that you will all be familiar and known and much beloved in our community um, that you'll, you'll see down here. But we also have uh, Pete Bartram here and Jonas Hostiger, if I've got that right. It's fine. Okay, we'll get over it. And 
you know, we'll, I'll have to pay him some money. But it's uh, essentially started about sort of four years ago, and sort of last time I was here, I was talking to you all through that heritage, and I'll sort of go through that just very, very briefly. Um, Eduardo and, uh, and uh, Victor uh, were the first two students to work on it, and they were essentially doing dev board work. How can you then build up our uplink and our downlink technology? How could you fit it all into a small sort of embedded microprocessor and do all of the things that you need to do for that all at the same time. So how can you run your DAX, your ADCs, your processing, everything all at the same time. After that, uh, we had two Bens, Ben Kluwer and Ben Chapman here. Um, so these guys were then the first guys to work on PCB designs, um, then the first revisions of those that then led us to then start doing the development and building things towards engineering models or elegant breadboards, as we would typically call them. Um, but then more lastly, we really then had uh, Pete and Jonas here, which has then carried that forward um, into then the full final sort of configuration that we've now uh, delivered out into Italy. So what's inside, as I've sort of said, there's roughly three boards, uh, a receiver, L-band, our transmitter on VHF, uh, and our CCT EPS there, properly labelled this time. Um, all of these sort of parts uh, sit in an anodized um, box, um, and it does all of these different things um, that we would typically want to do um, on one processing system, which is that challenge that we've already talked about. Uh, but we've also got to then communicate over CAN, and CAN open as, a, as the software stack, to then the rest of actually the bus uh, for ISAIO. So one of the other things that we do is we will collect the telemetry uh, from the main satellite bus and have that routed down to the ground as well. So if you're then running the ISAIO dashboard, you could then see, for instance, what the rest of the platform is doing. So we have things in there like the state vector, the GPS readings, the angular rates, all of those things will then be able to be plotted all then down on the, on, on the system. <coughs> now, most importantly, one of these things is to attempt to meet the ESA ECSS standards. Um, and in particular, to build up our internal confidence in our own processes as one of these sort of additional sort of challenges. And one of the pieces of work that Jonas will talk about a bit is, uh, is actually how we went about measuring ourselves compared to these other systems. So it's, you know, the payload is, is quite straightforward um, with those particular three boards. And it sits into a slightly bigger system uh, with the whole satellite itself. With the AMSAT, we've got then our transponder, we've got our command uplink on L-band still, and we then have our transponder um, coming down as well as our beacon. So we have different modes of operation that allow us to either go into data or to do transponder or to have special modes where if you key up your 67 hertz tone, it will automatically go into transponder um, so that you can then actually then operate it as a typical FM transponder. Um, there are other links, though, that are being developed as well. Uh, there's the uh, Science uh, S-Band um, as well. The actual payload unit itself is being developed out in uh, Poland by Wroclaw, um, and which is on the typical sort of 2.2 gigahertz commercial bands. <coughs> and that's going down <coughs> to a ground station uh, in the University of Munich. Um, but there's also command ones on UHF as well, which are going back um, to mainly to, to Italy and to Spain. Um, so these sort of things they're developing um, with MATLAB and Simulink, and just like we've been doing this project, um, again, it's a university development. So they've been doing things from scratch in MATLAB and in Simulink, working with USRPs and other sort of SDRs to build up their confidence. So what will we get from that? Well, and you've hopefully all seen a dashboard before. Hopefully there's no one in here that hasn't. Um, but we'll be able to then plot all of the typical telemetry. And one of the things that we've been talking about, certainly over the course of this, is plotting in multiple things at once. And so we've been sort of having certainly the, the first previews of being able to sort of test these sort of capabilities so we can see how different things might correlate with each other and you can plot these things on top of each other. Here we were looking at temperatures um, as well as currents as well. I mean, you can see what we're doing and when we're doing things with the transponder and, and different things. And so you can see physically what is happening to this system. So a lot of the electronics that we have on, on the power board and on the computing board are measurement points. They are essentially for us to measure the currents and voltages um, and raw sort of counts coming down from you know, signal strengths, et cetera. So the project has evolved massively, really, from sort of the breadboards in 2014 to where we are now in uh, 2018, where we've been delivering now uh, to Sitel. So Graham and I uh, took out our payload in August? In July, I think, but maybe you're right. Yeah, I think the beginning of August, um, where we 
uh, were able to sort of deliver it uh, out um, to, into Forley uh, and plug it into their systems to do some checkouts. Um, and they were really, really super happy um, with, with what we've been delivering. And of course, really, we're waiting now um, on some of the, the launch side um, and to look at the assessment of what's been happening in AIT. So here's a flashy video of a Zeo. A magic Hadouken, it should explode. It should explode. There we go. Um, and eventually, we will see our unit. No. There. So our unit obviously sits in that lower module. Uh, and we have then our VHF antenna. And on the underside of this is an L-band patch. Okay. Um, so in its nominal mode, you know, the L-band patch should be really much facing um, this side. It's where the other rest band is as well. Um, but you can see then the other sort of antennas, um, the main electronics ports, power boards. Um, and then some of the other payloads inside here. Um, so <coughs> they're sort of starting to ramp up now all of the communications, all the activity at ESA. Um, so you should be hearing a lot more out um, on the sort of regular feeds and networks and social face tubes and stuff like that. And so really, I sort of wanted to hand over to that point um, to Jonas, who can talk to us about one of the approaches that he's done for his MSC um, in lean satellite design. Jonas. So as Chris mentioned, I will talk a bit about the hardware side and the compliance side because that was what I was mainly involved in. And uh, one thing we try to do is follow a lean satellite design approach. And um, Chu et al. Um, said in a paper that this would be characterized by positive use of commercial of the, uh, commercial of the shelf uh, technology, um, allowing single points of failure, development and operation in a small team, taking care that the uh, failure of the single satellite doesn't impact the, the whole satellite mission or constellation. Uh, mission downtime is also acceptable. Mission durations are usually short. Um, waste is minimized. Explosive and toxic materials are usually avoided. And uh, the system overall is kept very simple and minimum pass control is used. So for that, we looked at our specifications. And the main specification we have is from our customer, from CTL. And um, they can be categorized like this a bit. So you can see that we had like different interface specifications for electrical, thermal, mechanical, but also some for the performance, electromagnetic compatibility, or for the verification and product insurance. But because this is also an ESA project, we were also looking at the ECSS specification, as Chris mentioned, which is a large framework of standards from ESA. And uh, most large um, space missions in Europe follow these standards. It's kind of a guideline. But since we are a small project, it's like unrealistic that we could follow all of them. And this is why ESA recently published also a CubeSat standard um, that contains tailored ECSS requirements that are a bit relaxed um, to be more suitable for smaller teams. So the customer specification was obviously mandatory for us to comply to, but we were also interested in how our compliance to ECSS and the CubeSat standard is. And as Chris said already, it would be desirable for us for internal confidence building and validation to be uh, compliant to a high degree. So on this picture, you can see our protoflight model, CCT and EPS board. So on the left side are all the digital components, the Atmel microprocessor, and on the right side you have all the power regulation. And um, I have another picture here, it shows the design where you can see all the traces running on the board. And I thought I'd point out some key areas we have here. So on the left, as I mentioned, is the microprocessor. Below there we have um, two chips here for the CAN bus, which are used to communicate with the satellite onboard computer. Then we have some over voltage protection here in case there's some spike from the coming from the platform. Then we have three power regulators here for 3.3, 6 and 9 volts. They're either used internally on the board or by the transmit and receive boards. And uh, we have an ADC there uh, that, allows, uh, that allows us to measure all the voltages and currents running through the regulators and also temperatures and at different positions uh, of the payload. 
So then I wanted to talk a bit about the tests we did to qualify our payload for space. So first we did a vibration test and luckily at the Surrey Space Center uh, we had our own facilities to do that and uh, there you can see me taking pictures of the payload we mounted there on an adapter plate on the shaker table we have. And this is an interesting example of where we had to make compromises um, regarding ECSS specifications because this is a flight model and this is not a very clean environment. So usually that, that's a no-go, but because we are a small team, we have a low budget, we had to improvise. So we um, covered all the holes of the payload with tape to avoid the contamination and also used, uh, used a plastic sheet because the shaker table is... Um, emitting a lot of dust and oil. So we try to keep the contamination as low as possible while doing this. So this is a video of um, the vibration test in uh, one axis we did. So that's a uh, sine vibration. So the frequency of the table shaking changes from I think about 5 hertz to 100 hertz with 16 G acceleration. And uh, that was quite an interesting experience. I'm not sure if you ever attended a test like this. It's really, really loud if you're actually there. And um, it looks pretty brutal. So we were all thinking, like, no way our payload will survive this. And something will come loose. But um, yeah, luckily, everything uh, worked. And after we did this in all three axes, um, we did a test. And the payload still worked fine. So um, we were really happy about that. Okay, so after that we went to the thermal vacuum test um, at uh, the Hubble Science and Research Park and uh, RAL Space was so kind to offer us their facilities to do that. And the reason we do that after the shaker test is because if something comes loose during the vibration, uh, uh, during the thermal vacuum test, the thermal expansion will often um, actually produce the failure. So something comes loose during vibration but it still works then during the vacuum test often you see that it comes loose completely and then fails. So in this picture you see the temperature profile we went through with our payloads. So it's four thermal th uh, cycles from minus 24, uh, 25 to 70 degrees over a period of around 48 hours. And during the first cycle and the last cycle, at the highest and lowest temperature point, we were commanding the payload. So you can see when we switch it on, there is a small spike because the temperature rises if all the electronics get switched on. And the three different graphs um, represent the temperature on three different positions on, on our payload. So yeah, that test uh, was successful as well. And um, finally, as part of my master project, I did a assessment of the compliance we had. And we were fully compliant to our customer specifications, but we're only 82% compliant to the CubeSat standard and only 57% um, to the ECSS standards, which is uh, not as high as we hoped. But um, I analyzed uh, 50, 519 requirements in eight different specifications from ESA to assess the detailed uh, compliance we had. So you can see like the green part here is compliant, the red part means not compliant. Because very often the requirements um, they have are way too challenging and we don't have the budget, the facilities, technology to, to be compliant to that. But um, overall, it also showed that even the CubeSat standard that, should, that is made for smaller teams, smaller projects, we were not able to be compliant to that. And that is because uh, mainly they use the same requirements as ECSS, but they're only a bit relaxed. But still, it's not very practical for small teams like us to use that as a guideline. This is why some researchers at the moment work on the um, ISO standard for lean satellite design. And we think that in the future this could uh, make it much easier for small teams to have a guideline um, for their project. So to summarize this, uh, we built a flight model compliant to the customer specifications and achieve 57% compliance to ECSS and 82% to CubeSat. Uh, we conducted a successful and extensive proto-flight model test campaign and uh, we think that the ISO standard that is in development 
could be very useful for future teams to uh, have a successful outcome of the project. And it was an excellent time working on the very exciting project with a fantastic team. So what happened after SEO to me so far? I completed my Master of Science with the SEO project, gained a lot of valuable experience uh, working on a real space mission, which was really exciting. And um, also a reason why I'm now in the Airbus graduate scheme, working as a payload systems engineer on passive microwave and radar payloads. And uh, we're doing really interesting stuff down in Portsmouth. Uh, we recently developed a um, radar prototype like this size and put it on a swarm of drones and flew around to acquire images from different locations and um, process all the different angles uh, to get a better resolution from a drone swarm. So we have our own labs there, oscilloscope, vector network analyzers, and we can just go there, build our prototypes ourselves. It's, it's really exciting work we're doing. And now I'm also doing my uh, radio foundation license. Um, yeah, yeah. Now it got me interested that project. And um, yeah, we were also involved in two publications based on this project. And one of them we presented in Budapest and won the best paper award on that conference, which we were really happy about. And yeah, you can see me and Chris holding the award and this is Pete and me giving our talk in, in Budapest. Okay, and now I can hand you over to Pete who will talk a bit more about the software side of the project. Thanks, Jonas. Uh, yeah, so as Jonas says, um, I'm gonna talk a bit more about the software side of things. That was primarily what I was involved with. Um, so on the right-hand side, you can see what the satellite looks like to um, everyone. And then on the left hand side, you can see what it looks like to someone that's writing software for it. Um, so in the middle here, we've got the AMSAT CPU. Um, and then in red are the hardware interface around the outside. Um, so to give you an idea of um, the CPU that we're working with, it's a 66 megahertz processor. Uh, we've got 512 kilobytes of uh, flash memory. So that's for storing uh, the program as well as filter lookup tables and things like that. Uh, we've then got 32 kilobytes of RAM uh, to play with, um, a 12-bit ADC, um, and a 10-bit DAC. Um, so it's not as bad as some of the processors of yesteryear, but it is still very much an embedded system. Um, so you have to work with those constraints. Um, so on the left-hand side here is the first interface. So this is an I2C bus. Um, and this is where all the sensor inputs, um, the ADCs are. It's all the telemetry that comes down in the Funcube or now Aseo dashboard. Um, that's picked up through this bus. Um, and this is sampled once every five seconds. Um, we've then got the ADCs here. Um, these are onboard ADCs. Um, but this is where the AFSK uplink um, is fed in. Um, and I'll get into sampling times in a minute, but that's being sampled at about um, nine kilohertz. Um, so that needs to be managed. Um, then we've got the DAX over here, which is what outputs our nice BPSK downlink signals. Um, and that is being sampled at 19.2 kilohertz. Um, so that also needs to be managed. Um, and then we've got our dual redundant CAM bus here, which is our communications link with the rest of the satellite. Um, so we can speak to the satellite onboard computer there. But also, as Chris said, we're a backup communication link for um, the other scientific payloads on board. Um, so that means that we need to be able to communicate with those to collect that data in the event of a primary comms failure. Um, so the main thing to take away from this is that there's a lot of things that need to be managed. Um, if we don't get our sensor data, we don't know if we're too hot. Um, we need to sample these correctly uh, to be able to communicate. And if we don't respond to messages on the CAN bus fast enough, then the main satellite will reset us. Um, so yeah, we need to handle timing carefully. Um, so how do we do this? Uh, so we decided to do this with an operating system, um, specifically a real-time operating system, um, and even more specifically than that, with FreeRTOS. Um, and there's two reasons for this. Um, one, FreeRTOS is used ubiquitously, so you know it's good, it's tried and tested. Um, and two, it's got really good tools for profiling what's actually going on in your processor. Um, so you can see here, this is one of the um, tools that they have available through a company called Persepio. Um, and this is a CPU usage diagram, so time along the x-axis, CPU usage on the y, uh, which gives you a really good view into the system, and I'll come back to these soon. Um, so when you use an operating system, you split things up into th what's called threads. Um, and for those of you that don't know what threads are, it's just um, like a program that runs on your CPU. Think of it kind of like an app. 
Um, so we have our um, CAN open thread over here, which handles all of uh, the communications on the CAN bus. Uh, we have a thread for downlink, uh, which is for the BPSK signal, uplink for the AFSK signal, um, telemetry threads, this is sampling the sensors, um, payload data transfer, so this is the scientific data transfer, and then finally satellite operations, so this is kind of the day-to-day -day, um, collecting of whole orbit data and just doing the things that need to be done um, to keep it ticking over. Uh, yeah, so the two that I was going to focus on most today, I thought would be most interesting, is kind of the downlink and the uplink thread. Um, speak about some of the processing challenges with those. Uh, so the first one is um, the uplink, which is AFSK. Um, and this works by constantly sampling in the background. Um, and you receive the signal, which in an ideal world would look something like this. Um, and you are constantly sampling, and you're looking for um, this being represented up here, which is called the sync vector. And then once you find that sync vector, um, then that means that what comes after that is the packet. So you need to be constantly, constantly sampling this in the background. Um, so in reality, what the signal looks like is a lot more like this, this blue one here. Um, it doesn't ever actually look like this. Um, so Chris mentioned Eduardo and Victor, the two Brazilian guys, um, and they really did the first work on this. Um, and they developed this here where they're decoding up here, um, ma matching decision points here, and um, they put in some phase compensation. So when we took over, this was kind of working, um, at least at a rudimentary level. Um, but they did a good job on that. Um, so to develop this further, um, when we received it from them and plugged in this uh, CPU usage tool, uh, we found that uh, the code that they had decoded successfully 100% of the time, but it used 99% of the processor use, um, process, processing time. Uh, as you can imagine, the CPU usage graph was up here. Um, and ECSS standards say that you can't use more than 50% of the processor at any one time. Um, so kind of ignore this for now, but I'll come back to it. Um, so the Multimon software that it's based on, by default, was sampling at 22 kilohertz. Um, to get that 99% success rate. So the first thing we thought was, okay, it's a 1.2 kilohertz signal coming in. Can we reduce that down? Uh, so we reduced this down to 8.8 um, .8 kilohertz, uh, and we found that it had 45% process usage, so that's good, below the 50%, uh, but only with a 70% success rate, which is bad. Um, we decided that we would need a 99% success rate under laboratory conditions to give us the confidence that we would need to put this into orbit. Um, so finally, we found the point where that 99% was, and we found that was sampling at 11 kilohertz, um, and that gave us 70% process usage, uh, which wasn't below the 50%. So after kind of panicking about that for a while, um, we came back and kind of looked at it a bit objectively, went into the Multimon software, and found that the way that they were storing numbers in memory, uh, for those of you that know floating point versus fixed point, um, meant that it was not running optimally for a processor like this. Uh, so we changed that to then use fixed point um, arithmetic, um, and that brought us down to the processor usage that you see here, um, about 28%, I think. Yeah, 28%. Um, so that's below ECSS standards. Um, it was acceptable, so we've stuck with that. Uh, so a little bit about the downlink. Um, so this is a BPSK downlink. Um, as Chris said, there's two modes. There's 1K2 mode for regular data, and then we have 4K8 mode for scientific data. Um, so what we do in 1K2 mode is every five seconds we take a snapshot of the system as a whole. So that's all of the telemetry points. Um, we then put that in a packet, and then that's what will be uh, forward error corrected um, and then sent down. So that's a 256-byte packet, which gets converted to a 650-byte packet with all of the forward error correction on, um, and that gives you 4.3 seconds worth of data plus the seven-second tone that you all hear in the dashboard. Um, now, that packet's digital, um, and if you feed the digital signal into David's mixer, then this horrible bleeding into all of these frequencies here um, is what you get. Um, so obviously, that's unacceptable. Um, so what we needed to do was use some kind of filtering uh, before we fed that into David's mixer, um, and to do that, to, to do that in software. Um, so for that, we use the root raised cosine filter, which is what this equation up here is, um, and that gives you this nice um, frequency response here, um, and the uh, response there as well. 
Um, so filtering uses a mathematical process called, well, either fast Fourier transforms or convolution. And this isn't something you want to do on an embedded processor. Um, so with a lot of help from the team, uh, specifically Duncan, Chris, and Howard, a lot of help from Howard, actually, um, we converted this to use lookup tables within the memory. So this cost us a lot of our flash um, and quite a lot of our RAM as well, but it meant that we could do this in a reasonable time um, on the processor, so it was the only way we could get around that. Um, so yeah, once we put this filter, um, filter in, then these are the results you can see. So this is the signal going to the mixer, and you can see it's nice and kind of sinusoidal, um, nice and smooth. Um, so that's 1K2 mode, and then 4K8 mode, slightly sharper edges. Um, but that's because we don't change the oversampling rate. Uh, we don't change that 19.2 kilohertz um, going in. And then, yeah, you can see the nice uh, 1.2 kilohertz and then the wider 4.8 kilohertz signal here coming down. So the downlink is slightly different from the uplink. Um, so with the filtering, okay, that you have this kind of background noise going on, which is these um, green here. You can see it's, it's quite low. But that forward error correction process, again, that's a convolutional process. It's expensive. Um, and that's what this spike is. So we get one of these. Um, in 4K8 mode, we get it once a second. In um, 1K2 mode, we get it once every five seconds. You get these big spikes where you're using the whole processor. Again, we needed to ensure that the rest of the threads are being able to run, so um, the uplink and the whole orbit data collection. Um, so to do this, we used another tool from Persepio. Um, and um, on the vertical here, you can see the thread, um, the downlink thread here, and the uplink thread. And what this shows us is that although we're using 100% the processor, the free, uh, free RTOS is ensuring that we still allow the other threads time to run. This is what gives us the confidence that this is going to then work on orbit. Uh, yeah, so to summarize, um, there's lots of time and critical tasks to manage. Um, and the best way to go about solving this, we found anyway, um, is to use free RTOS or to use a real-time operating system. We can recommend free RTOS. Uh, just because of the excellent system view. It kind of gives you an unparalleled glimpse into what's actually going on. Um, encoding and decoding is expensive computationally, um, and processes that we can put up into orbit aren't quite at the point where you can do everything quite how you want, and you have to make trade-offs with lookup tables, um, memory versus processor, that, that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, it's just been a really fun project to be involved with. Um, and as I say, um, excellent support with um, getting stuck with certain parts of it, like the filtering, um, someone always steps up and, and helps. Um, so, post Asayo, um, at the kind of lowest possible level, um, this was a third of my MSC. Um, so, you know, this project has got me an MSC essentially. Uh, but it's done more than that because it's given experience working on a real space mission, which is awesome, if nothing else. Um, like, when it launches, it's going to be great. Like, I'm really looking forward to that. Um, again, working with a very skilled, enthusiastic team. As I say, people have a lot of knowledge about a specific area. And we've had lots of sessions together at Surrey Space Center, um, working together. And we've always got loads out of those. You know, we've achieved more in a weekend together than you know, any of us alone could have done in you know, 10 times that amount of time. Um, so I'm currently a PhD candidate at the University of Southampton, working in astrodynamics, uh, particularly large-scale simulations of how um, clouds of things move in space. Um, and this isn't something I could have got into, I don't think, without um, having this on my CV. Um, something like this puts you, you know, ahead of, of other candidates, um, even if not necessarily in the interview, but definitely to get you into the interview. Um, so that's been, yeah, really important to me. Um, and, yeah, two publications from this, as Jonas says, um, the one in Budapest we won, um, this one, we won the award for best paper. Um, we've had chances to speak at two conferences. Um, so this puts me in an excellent position for applying for, for postdocs. So potentially, um, four years after I finish writing code from this, um, I could still be benefiting from it. So I definitely recommend getting involved if anyone's thinking about it. I'll hand you over to Chris. I'll put this one, put this one down for now. Yeah, I'm, I'm wired. Yeah.
Always wired. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, you can obviously see the sort of different sort of MSCs that the guys have had to uh, um, work on um, at Surrey Space Centre and, and working with the AMSAT team as well, the FunCube team. Um, and sort of the step after that really was then sort of bringing that together. Um, so the compliance went up, we had to do further work um, and build a, a new board that they can then fit in with more uh, of, of that. So our compliance, we haven't measured the new compliance of that system. We haven't had, we haven't had a Jonas really inside the building to help us measure. Um, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure we had fun reading 520 odd specs. Um, you know, we're deeply thankful for him just for even understanding how this gets measured. Um, uh, so one of the things that we hadn't done um, after your TVAC, after your, uh, your vibration test, is electromagnetic compatibility and interference tests. Um, and this is where you go into massive anechoic chambers. In this case, we're very thankful to um, Professor Pavel um, out in Vroslav in Poland. Poland. Um, and we, he has a massive chamber that's the size of this room, but in that way as well, in height. Um, and this is where we can essentially then measure um, the susceptibility by wanting to inject um, electromagnetic uh, interference, perhaps, along the wire, um, or as well as then to measure, really, what sort of things are emitting in different modes. So what we would do is we would have to then set out in very specific ways then our power supplies, our units, putting things into different loads. And then they had these very, very odd and interesting antennas um, that they would use. And these, these ones were the size of the length of that table out to here, um, for measuring different sort of sets of frequencies. Uh, so we had sort of this one. I don't even know what that one's called. Right? Biconical. Biconical, that's it. Yeah. Biconical antennas. We then, then had a log periodic. And that log periodic took us from uh, 30 megs or 300 megs up to about 3 gig. And then after 3 gig up to 16 gig, we then had a, a horn antenna. Um, so what you would do typically is you would then measure what happened. There we go. It gets there. It gets there. Um, and you can see then where perhaps we might change the antenna. So we would then be measuring really what was happening. Um, this is here, was looking at what was coming out of our unit. Um, and you can see here we, we, what we have. We might have a piece there. Um, and then we had our big one massive spike at our transmit frequency. But when we then had to change antennas, you'd have to go in, change the antennas to do a different thing. And you can see these sort of jumps um, in this plot, really, of where we were sort of measuring from. Um, but this was, this was really good. Our compliance level was sort of up here. And um, the only sort of fouling we had um, was actually this. So a non-compliance that we actually technically had um, was the fact that in the specifications, it didn't then chisel out our actual transmitter. Um, so technically, non-compliance. Um, we then had to check the harmonics as well. And we were looking at one that was very, very close uh, to the, some of the uplinks and the downlink ones on UHF. Um, and we missed it by. It was a couple of hundred kilohertz, so we were, we were, we were way off it, really. Um, well, it was, it was quite far, it was quite far. So the other images uh, that Graham alluded to in yesterday's AGM, um, that we're very happy to show that have been now released by ESA, um, can be found on this website. Um, and you can see kind of now what it uh, looks like in, its, in its, most of its glory there, um, naked. And then, of course, here is where it's um, obviously got its modesty. Um, on, the, on the sort of ch shaker table here with the solar panels on and all of the different leads uh, for looking at all your big test points that you would want to look at. Um, but we're seeing it come together like this has obviously been a labour of love for some of us for, for, for many, many years um, coming into. Um, so super happy to see this like this and the, and the guys that will be actually going out uh, to ESA next week um, to then understand what's happening. And so they as well have been releasing the footage again as well of the of some of the vibration tests. So they've been testing out in Italy um, what's been going um, on. Ah, uh, yes. So uh, as we said, there's two antennas on here. There's an L-band that sits under here. And this rather long one is the, is the VHF one. And the antenna itself is actually um, uh, a piece of uh, core with uh, carbon fiber wrapped around it. So we had lots of discussions at how we would survive um, the particular launch loads that we wanted to do. So these, this is actually uh, the launch loads for the, all the other CubeSats and missions that we've done on even some of the more commercial things, um, the specs for vibration in this case um, were actually pretty harsh. You know, they wanted you to really meet um, what could potentially go um, you know, for a Vega, really. And so some of this stuff is quite, quite high levels of G-forces. Sorry? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, when it's all put together, you just think, oh, God, no. It's your baby. 
Um, so what have they been uh, doing? So since we've sort of been delivering it, they've been uh, testing our payload, um, and they've sent us some data back through one of the logs out of the Funcube dashboard. Uh, and we can see in some of this data where they've then been changing it between different modes, getting data from payloads, downlinking it to the ground, pushing it into different high power modes. And we can then see that they're, they're actively using our system and we know that at least it's, it's being exercised. Um, what we don't yet know, um, and one of the things that hopefully we'll find out when the guys go out, um, will be to understand what have you been pushing through it? Is there any way that we can help and validate what's happening? So sort of in the event that we do need to use our backup system, how, how do we then uh, get this sort of system through? So they have to make sure they check the right points um, and we at least know where the data is and what it's meant to look like. So we, we need to do some of those validation checks as well. Um, so watch this space. Thankful to all the people here, um, Easter Education, East in general, uh, AMSAT UK, of course, sorry for this facilities, um, and the Persepio guys for help, you know, giving us you know, uh, an opportunity to look into their into their tools in, in sort of real anger. Um, and of course, thanks to, to the students actually with, with which I wouldn't be able to do any of this. Um, that hats off um, completely to, the, to these guys that, you know, they've, they keep, you know, they've left university. This guy graduated two years ago, okay? And, and I keep grabbing him in to come back and just, oh, can you just give a talk? Just, just, yeah, just one more. Just yeah, just go to the Netherlands. Yeah, that's what you're doing next week. Um, but it's exciting stuff. Um, you know, hopefully they, you know, they would struggle to get anywhere else. And this community is, is, is part of that and it enables students to sort of get involved in these things. Um, and I think that's wonderful. So I think, thanks very much to those. Um, and I am done. Right. Yeah, it's on. Thanks. Thanks, guys. That was uh, absolutely brilliant. Congratulations. And uh, congratulations as well on the follow-on career. That's uh, really good to hear, staying in the space business. So any questions? Loads of questions. Pick the mic further. Uh, uh, what electronics have you used uh, for the PCB? Because I heard it uh, should be qualified for space, I guess. You mean like uh, what components we used? Yeah, so usually in a satellite you would use uh, radiation hardened or radiation tolerant components, but. Um, we didn't do that, but when possible, we tried to use automotive components who are a bit more resilient than standard components, but it's still not something ESA would use on a, on a large space mission. But yeah, it does a job for us, and we are pretty confident that they will survive this. Okay, any more questions? Absolutely. Some of them, in fact, were published in Oscar News, um, so you can see them there. Um, and they're on the IEEE website. If you can't get them, um, give, us, give us an email, uh, and I'll send you a copy. Yeah. Okay, any more? Good. Another? Oh, yeah, go for it. <laughs> okay, we've got time. I'm guessing this is for you. <laughs> uh, question about software. <laughs> so, uh, just can you give a brief... Uh, explanation why uh, ESA has uh, this 50% uh, 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 CPU usage requirement because it's uh, not very clear. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, so it, yeah, kind of, I, I, I don't necessarily agree with it being um, a ne necessity, uh, but ESA have it there. They have constraints on that and on the memory usage. So I think with the memory, it's if you're dynamically allocating memory, then you need to know that you've always got stuff there to use. And I think with the processor um, requirements, it's so that if something goes wrong and your processing load is uh, bigger than it's supposed to be, um, then you're still able to deal with that and cope with it and have the system run reliably. So. It come, comes from um, some heritage stuff, actually, from uh, uh, temperatures as well. So you know your clocks might shift on a processor. Things go out of sequence. Mainly temperature. Okay, thanks. Well, we've just got to the end of time, so thank you very much again. And let's thank them again for that uh, wonderful presentation. We're back.